Welcome to Bullet Point Bulletin's weekly wrap-up for February 19th, 2023. I'm Bruce Burke. I'm here in front of the paywall. I'm here with my good friend, Ted Huff, and he's also my co-host, and he's also the host of FinTech Confidential, and he does all kinds of stuff. I'm going to send it over to Ted, and Ted's going to tell you guys what we're talking about today. So today we're going to be going over how Paxos says categorically they are not a security to the SEC. We're going to also bring in Caitlin Long, the founder CEO of Custodia Bank, how she talks about in her recent article how Washington, D.C.'s misguided crackdown on high integrity innovators could be harming our future in blockchain and cryptocurrency. Then Brian Armstrong warns the Congress that if they don't regulate fast, and correctly, that we're going to lose is the United States. We're going to lose the businesses to other financial hubs like rival jurisdictions of Hong Kong or, or London. And then we dive into Venom Blockchain and Dow Maker. Seems they've partnered as an incubator for Web3 startups. And Dow Maker is going to be providing their, their expertise in that area. And then last but not least, fresh off the Super Bowl, um, Rihanna, her NFTs, OpenSea has decided to stop selling them because it promises fractional ownership and future profit-based uh, ownership of, of residuals when, when, um, when she actually has royalties from the, the songs and the different things that she has from her latest releases. So it's, it's getting a little crazy. Um, though, Hey, the nice part is with Rihanna and we'll get into this a little bit later. Open is not the only player in the game. Thank goodness for that. But Bruce, let's, let's hop into Paxos. And I mean, they've been in the, the, the news a lot over the last couple of weeks and they're really pushing hard against this stuff. And I'd like to to start with your perspective on that. Well, um, it, it's with me. I mean, uh, I just did a story a little while ago about Paxos and MasterCard, right? So I'm wondering how this kind of action, you know, which is, you know, uh, not, uh, you know, the, the best light on them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how this is going to affect deals with other banks and MasterCard and uh, other things like that. Um, I understand that they're uh, in kind of a weird situation here, but what it seems like is there's two BUSDs from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And one was a Binance USD, and one was a BUSD that was being in issued by Paxos. And uh, essentially, Binance said, we're not backing the BUSD that's being issued by Paxos. That's not our backing. And so I'm going to leave it to you to grab it from there. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so, so I think I think the biggest piece that, that really what we find out here is um, – Binance allowed Paxos to mint BUSD tokens. Um, and by the way, BUSD is a stable coin um, tied to the U.S. dollar. And realistically, this is where things get a little interesting is because there's the, the PBUSD token and a BSUD token. And we don't really know which one the government's really talking about They're, they've just kind of left it really really high level and I, I guess where i'm going with this is paxo says hey every token that we've issued or coin that we've issued for b o b s b u s d wow i'm having a hard time saying this b u s d is backed one for one for a dollar we've got it in in accounts they're accounted for you're right they aren't accounted for in binance's uh, books, but they're accounted for in our books. And I think this is like the first time that you're going to start to see these multiple entities that are able to mint coins that are, that are on the same chain. And we're starting to see this interoperability. And this is one of the things we were talking about last week that the government isn't used to seeing interoperability, two different people that can do the same thing on the same, on the same rail, on the same item other than the U.S. dollar that the federal government gets to do. 
And so it's, it's starting to get in that little area and, you know, the interpretations of the security laws are really basic. It's the Howey test. Um, and, and it's also and, coming at a weird time where, uh, Binance is kind of in flux, so to say, uh, they're considering like kind of pulling out of the U S it seems like, uh, from, from some of the things I've read where they're, uh, so they got the, the Binance U S right. And then they got mm-hmm. the, uh, and it's two different corporations, but apparently there was some money that changed hands between the two of. Uh, you know, in the, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And so uh, I'm thinking that Binance in order to save itself is going to uh, withdraw from the U S and this is kind of, I think kind of coupled with that. I'm not 100% sure if it's, you know, uh, uh, you know, predicated on that, but I, I think it has a little bit to do with it. Uh, and so, you know, it, uh, I'm not saying it's a mess. Uh, Paxos to me sounds like a you know really you know Mastercard's just not going to jump out and do business with you know uh, uh, you know they're doing business with PayPal they're doing business with all kinds of companies. I don't think uh, lesser because of Paxos of this. I think this is more you know the SECs continue to come down and this is the fallout from that right and and uh, and Binance is essentially. Uh, trying to save its own skin, uh, you know, as, as all everybody is here, though, you know, but um, it's um, there's a lot to follow, you know so, what I mean? So and there's what, not a lot of information. Yeah. One of the things I find kind of funny um, or or I, I, I draw correlations to is that Circle has been um, trying to be like a canary in the coal mine. So Circle warned about a couple other things. They they warned the New York regulators about the PEG version or P PBUSD um, having issues, and and I think that they're trying to. And I and I love the folks from Circle. I I spend a lot of time with them, but I, from my perspective, it feels like they're saying we are the USD token, other than you know that that everybody should be focused on. Um, don't look at Binance, don't look at Tether, but look at us. We, we are the USD token that you should be, should be leveraging. So there, I, I see them kind of politically positioning themselves as to be the preferred USD token, uh, in there. So that's one of the things that has been really interesting, but also Paxo said, Hey, we understand you guys don't like what's going on here. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to stop maintaining the the BUSD tokens um, just to make you guys happy until we can figure this stuff out. So you're, you're seeing a lot of these things happen where the behavior is starting to change. Now, the whole thing with Binance, um, it's really complicated um, in, in that area. We talked about um, them losing their ability to do uh, U.S. transfer type functionality they still can do their normal business in the U.S. What they were struggling to do is is do USD to USD transfers from U.S. to other countries. Um, and, and I mean, honestly, you look at that, and if I'm a regulator, I'm going to be looking at it as the anti-money laundering um, fraud that could be going on that we're going about or we're thinking about. And that ties into the piece that you talked about with the 400, I think it was 400 million or 400 yeah. million dollars that got moved um, from the Binance U.S. to Binance um, umbrella. And I think one other thing to, to keep in mind for a lot of people is like having different entities within different countries under a, a global umbrella is not unusual. And that really has to do with the, the U.S. restrictions on the types of businesses and how you have to structure the businesses to have that happen. So if you look at any major corporation in the in the world, they have entities in each one of your jurisdictions so that they can maintain the laws within the jurisdictions. It's not that they're trying to get around things. It's not that they're trying to do something shady. It's really the goal is to meet the the criteria and the regulation and to be able to provide a product that fits within that structure. And so I I want just kind of to think about that when you hear about these, these crypto companies and these blockchain companies that have offices all around the world, it is really to be able to provide it within the regulatory structure 
for that region. So, uh, Bruce, yeah, they're, I, they're I think, not they're no, they're not trying to do it to to be shady or anything no. like that. They're if they're anything, they're strictly, trying to be transparent. Uh, um, yeah, in most cases, uh, uh, there are companies that do such things and, and utilize, uh, and, there and then there's, uh, just to be, uh, real about it, there is companies that, you know, hold, uh, offices in certain countries to escape tax restrictions and, uh, that sort of thing. So, you know, it's, uh, but I'm not saying any of that's happening here. Moving on to the next story here. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so, so you know, we talked about all the shady different things that could be going on, right? Um, and, and Caitlin Long is the founder and CEO of Custodia Bank, which we talked about a little while back that, that they got denied a federal charter through the FDIC and being able to be, I shouldn't say not FDIC, the, um, the Federal Reserve denied them to become a member. And yeah. so that really is is kind of a big deal because you know, they they were really trying to approach it from the perspective of we are following the rules we're going to follow them to the letter we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we are providing these crypto companies like FTX and others and um, Coinbase and that we're providing them a place that they can that you can truly trust that's going to have the government regulatory back. And, you know, she was a little upset because she pointed out all these things that were going on outside and saying, see, these guys are doing this and it's shading. It's going to cause some problems. And we're doing it this way, which is not going to cause problems. Please let us fix this over here. And the government said, I appreciate your insight, but we're going to keep going. So this is this is just a really, really high level piece of it. I mean, she has been in in Bitcoin really, really heavy since 2012. So she's not new to this. Um, so she knows it really well. But I think this just kind of shows that uh, we need some more regulation. And she covers some really cool stuff in her article. But Bruce, I'll, I'll let you get your, I know this is a relatively new story for you, but uh, what was your perspective when you read through it? Um, To me, it's like, uh, there's like when Salesforce came out, you know, and they were in the cloud, right? They're like, mm-hmm. we're not the cloud, right? You know, we're, we're not, we're not the, uh, uh, EXE, right? You don't have to install anything, right? No EXEs here, right? Right. Uh, every company in some way, shape or form usually calls out the competition, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. tries to make, you know, uh, tries to sling mud without like making it look like they're slinging mud, you know, and, and, uh, uh draws comparison. Um, I think that's kind of what their market is or what they're, the way they're trying to position themselves. However, the government doesn't want sheriffs, right? I mean, the, the government wants to do the, the way it, the government's going to do it. And thanks for the information. You know, we're, we're glad to take the information from you. And thanks so much for giving us that information. But we'll take care of it, right? This is not your place to take care of it. Everybody wants to be the default USD token. Of course. <laughs> Every company in the world wants to be the default USD token. That's why Sam was, you know, on Capitol Hill so much and, and, and doing what he did. Uh, you know, he wanted to become the default uh, digital currency, right? Uh, the yep. platform for it. Let's say that, right? Yeah. Um, and he wanted, to be the, he wanted to be the centralized location that the federal government trusted and gave the rights to. I mean, just like any time that the government put, puts out a, a, a RFP to bid on being, heck, a landscaper, a trucking company, a, a cleaning yeah. facility. I mean, yeah. everything. Supply that, hammers to us, right? Exa- uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah th- th- that's a little bit different these days. But but yeah, I mean, so I mean, I also looking at it this way is, you know, Yes, she and, and, and the bank, you know, warned a bunch of different things. But one of the things that was in the article that I, I really liked, actually, let me just pull that article up. Uh, I'm yeah, skipping through and I'm helps, enjoying so. the conversation, skipping through some of the stuff here. Um, come on, come on. Um, so let me pull her, pull her up. Let me, I've got thing too. I've got too many things going on here, man. That's what's going on. Um, yeah. let me share this here. Um, so one of the things windows. that, yeah, definitely. So one of the things that I really, really liked that she pointed out 
um, is really crypto is like inve- investing in mutual funds before 1940. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, I know we laugh about it a little bit, right? But but the really cool part about this is that she brings that up because when you look at it, it really was. It was very similar. And and I, I dove in and really looked at it and looking at the way that they handled the mutual funds back then, it is almost identical to the, the approach that they're taking with crypto today. And so we always have to look at the history and look at the past and see how we've reacted to things in the past. And she calls it, I mean, this is an amazing article and really calls out some stuff that maybe I didn't even notice. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm really, really happy to to see that piece of it. It, it um, Whatever is new is always going to come under scrutiny, right? Any kind of innovation. It, you can go all the way back to like cyber cash wallet, right? Like way, way, way back in the day, right? Uh, anything that comes out that's new and different is going to have uh, a scrutiny on it. And if it's doesn't fit into the mold, it's going to be crazy until it's accepted. And yeah, it's going to be viewed as it's going to be viewed as crazy until it's accepted. Yeah, and and it's I I don't think there needs to be a whole lot of more. Uh, I don't like the word regulation. I think there needs to be more innovation in government than there is regulation, right? Um, and I, I think we need to quit calling them the regulators and start calling them the innovators and start looking at, you know, what what they're, you know, we need to, instead of writing legislation for regulation, write legislation to empower innovation. Yeah. is what we need to be doing. It seems like to me, you know, we've talked about like Singapore before, and that's something that they're doing. Yes, they're a very small country, right? It, it, it's very enforceable, that sort of thing. But we could use this as an example. We need to write legislation as, uh, for innovation, not for regulation. Yeah. Well, and, and you, I love how you bring that up because it is really regulatory innovation is what we need. And and by by doing that regulatory innovation means looking at it differently than we've always looked at it, responding differently to the way we've always responded to it. And one of the really cool things is that's a nice segue into our next next subject. Um, you know, Hong Kong legalized crypto trading, um, and Brian Armstrong immediately jumps up and goes, "Hey, Washington, take a look at this." If we don't do something really quick, we will be will be put to pasture when it comes to crypto, when it comes to all these different things. Um, you know, if you really look at it, the UK has passed a bunch of, of things specifically around the Web3 products and services. Hong Kong is going that direction. Um, and I'm pointing this way because that's where my screen is. <laughs> um, but, I mean, they're all going this direction. And... This is something we have to look at. We have to look at regulatory innovation so that we can maintain and continue to move forward as an innovative in, in innovative nation, and especially in anything that is financial in nature. We've been really, really big at it. London's always been a little bit ahead of us because a little bit more broad in their policies. But I, I think we will not maintain our, our our status of being an innovative nation if we can't figure out how to regulate regulate this through innovation, like you said. Wow, I was. Uh, it was something. interesting in that article. Uh, one of the statements, I think it was in the first paragraph, maybe it was the second. Uh, they were talking about, and of course, uh, uh, everybody wants to be the default stable coin of the <laughs> of the uh, 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 Hong Kong uh, dollar, right? Uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, wherever that's going on, that's the real push for most companies, right? That, that, that's what everybody really wants. Um, but it also, to me, I think he's right, you know, uh, but I think he's wrong 
because Congress doesn't do anything fast, right? So if he's calling on them to quickly do something, I mean, legislation takes forever. I mean, they're publishing, you know, uh, things that are, you know, this thick, you know what I mean? Um, it's, <laughs> and to get everybody to agree on it, you know, and, and, and pass it through is tremendous, you know? Um, so I think, again, they need to quit calling for regulators. They need to start calling for innovators, really. Uh, I, I'm just going to reiterate that again in this story. I, I, I hate to get stuck on stupid, but it's the same thing here. It's uh, we're, we're the slowest to the punch. We're like the apple of the world with uh, this right now, right? Uh, are we going to do it better than everybody else when we finally get around to doing it? You know, that's what we really need to be focusing on now. Is just yeah. let's get some, let's get a framework out there. Let's get a, a, a chassis for the car first, right? And we'll improve it as we go up, you know, and, and it'll eventually become a Rolls Royce, you know. But. Uh, you know, you, you got to start off with just some basic framework and some basic uh, 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 underpinnings. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's where Brian Armstrong, by the way, he's the CEO of Coinbase, if you, if you don't know who he is. Um, but, you know, I think that's what he's trying to get at here. He's like, hey, the, the enforcement agencies, hey, you guys are going a little overboard. Um, <laughs> and, and, and he's saying it in a nice way. He's like, hey. The regulators, not the legislators, the regulators. So SEC, um, <clears throat> CFPB, yeah. all that fun stuff, right? Yeah. They're going over. Hey, guys, calm your shit down. Just calm down. Let's get some legislation in place. I know it's going to take a little bit, but let's let's get that in place so that we can continue to innovate and not be left behind by the UK, Europe, Hong Kong. I mean, China's looking at Hong Kong as being their their crypto hub. And, and really long term focus on becoming that. And honestly, if we don't want the world order to change where we're leading the pack and China is in second place or Russia is in second place or whatever place, uh, everybody's at, we, most of the commerce is done in U.S. dollars. Most of the commerce globally is done in U.S. dollars. Do we want that to be Chinese yuan? And, and that's kind of how I'm looking at it, is that this is them stating, we're coming for you. And if you can't keep up, it was nice to know you. And that's kind of my 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 perspective. What I'm kind of looking at from a global economic perspective is you've got London and China. London used to be a world powerhouse, you know, the UK. Then we picked it up. Do we really want to hand it off to to China? So I'm I'm just I'm going into that because I'm I think it's crazy that the thing the way that things are being treated right now. Um, it's, I, I think the, uh, the U S right now is being so harsh, I guess, or, or, you know, uh, being so, uh, so downward thrust, you know, on mm -hmm. this is because of what recently happened with Do Kwan, right? Uh, what recently happened with Sam, what recently happened with Genesis and well, how uh, Celsius. That happens with our and banks. But that happens with banks every single day. That happens with, with investment firms every single day. It happens with all of our financial institutions every single day. But I think day. people are call, uh, people who invested, invested largely and are somehow getting to, you know, legislatures, uh, legislators and, you know, asking them to enforce it, right? Where with the banks, that doesn't happen apparently, right? Uh, nobody has enough money to go after the banks apparently, right? So, uh, again, these are easy targets too, right? They're, that, you know, they're, I, that's exactly right. You hit that right on the head. Low because hanging know, fruit. Well, yeah, it's definitely those who are new to the game, newish to the game. Um, and, and I mean, I know for certain that a number of letters were delivered to Capitol Hill last week on, excuse me, on the 14th, um, by a number of, uh, what are they called? Um, uh, lobbyist groups to try and make it even harder on the cryptocurrency and all of the blockchain and web three stuff because they don't understand it and they see it as a threat. And there were very few 
there were like a couple lobby groups for for that there. And, you know, when you have a 10 to one ratio of four against versus four, uh, it's really, really hard to get heard. Yeah, that, um, that that's lunches and dinners and martinis uh, every day exactly. versus a uh, 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 sandwich at uh, you know uh, Jimmy John's I know, I was <laughs> on a that Wednesday. <laughs> right. So I mean, so that's that's one of the big things you have to keep in mind. And you know, I, I, I there there are you know we talked about it last week, and and I probably got a little harsh on it, but really looking at it is none of the senators, none of the uh, you know, none, none of none of the house, the house or Senate have the ability to go deep, deep, deep down in. So, you know, they've created these little groups where they go and collect the information, they summarize it, they bring it to them. But a lot of the information that they're getting from these experts are from both sides of the table. Whichever one screams the loudest actually wins. And so they aren't they're only getting part of the story. They're not getting the whole story. Um, and it's very hard for them to get the whole story. So, you know, I, I was a little harsh last week, but I, I really wish there was a way to get them a better version of the whole story versus the one that's being being told. So, um, well, it, it's just one more comment on this. It's new to everybody. Right. I mean, I've been in this thing, you know, a long time, you know, uh, you and I were in fintech before they called it fintech. Right. And mm-hmm. uh, we've been at this thing a long time. And it's a lot to keep up with. There's a lot that's brand new, right? There's a lot oh, of yeah. new companies springing up. They're throwing billions of dollars at it. So you got to think there's money in it, right? Uh, you know, when you see uh, A16Z and SoftBank and, you know, uh, Elon and, you know, mm-hmm. everybody else just, you know, throwing money at it. Not so much this year, but last year, right? But there, there is so much you know, oh, there's going still on. There's a ton of money going after it this year. Right. Oh, crazy. So, you know... It, even for me, I mean, I'm learning new stuff every day. So, I mean, you yeah. know, and, and senators and congressmen and all that, they get so much else to do besides just this. focus on this, right? right? And, I mean, they got, you know, families, they got, you know, disasters, you know, who knows, yeah. you know? And so it, they get five minutes, you know? Uh, they get five minutes with this, and it's hard to summarize something that's burgeoning like this and growing uh and and you know obviously of great interest to people that have very deep pockets right uh Mm -hmm. but it also seems of uh deep non-interest to others that also have very deep pockets and they don't want it to exist so yeah it it, like like you said i mean it's it's a data point for them in our daily lives um we we seem to see it very, being very big, and you know I, I've been involved in blockchain and crypto since about 2013, um, and and so I've seen it transition from from being like oh yeah that's that's a fun toy, to it's actually useful to now it's a threat, um, so it's been really interesting to watch that and honestly the financial industry really didn't see it as being viable until the last couple of years, last two, three years. So I think timing is is right. I mean, just like everything, you, you've got to have a catastrophic event to push stuff forward. And and I think we've had that with, with like you mentioned, like with- Yeah, the they had the shootout and, in Dodge City already. I mean, the shootouts yeah. happened, right? Uh, yep. Not to go down a rabbit hole or anything, but because, uh, <laughs> you know, I won't. Um, but, you know, in talking about blockchain and all this, I had a memory last night. Uh, I was at uh, and this goes way, way, way back. Uh, this was when I was transitioning from prepaid, like into the mobile mm-hmm. wallet space. Right. I think this was mm-hmm. pre social mobile payments. I went to a card and, and uh, a prepaid conference at a. Denver Airport Hotel, and it was the oh worst hotel gosh. in the world. I, I, I think I know it, which one you're talking about. And it was a. Uh, I met uh, a couple different people there that I'm still friends with. Uh, but um, there, there was a uh, a sponsored event on the second 
the I think it was the last session of the last day, mm-hmm. and it was a, a card printing machine company, right? That would like emboss, uh, you know, uh, debit cards oh, and yeah. that kind of stuff. That was the sponsor for this. And I was standing outside and I was talking to this guy, Brent, and I think his last name is Elsinger or something like that, right? And Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I've come up with this concept of, you know, every dollar bill has like a serial number on it, right? A a sequence of letters and numbers that identifies it. And I said, and I've got this idea for digital payments. When you put in your digital dollar, which has a sequence of numbers, when you get change back, each piece of that change De, de, depending on what increment it's divided into has uh-huh. a number like that. Right. So, uh-huh. you know, if you put in 20 and you're getting 15 back, right. Uh, so to speak, right. Uh, it, it's, it was a precursor idea that I had that I didn't fully think out that really is blockchain. The yeah. concept is, is blockchain, right? Uh, well, it's, a to- it's tokens, so- right? So you're you're really talking about tokens and yes. sub tokens, and, and that that's kind of what goes into it. And and I think blockchain oh, Santosh, falls right, right into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, definitely, dude. And I mean, there there are so many projects that that I've I've come across that had I only had the intestinal fortitude to drive forward with some of the ideas I had, um, would it would have been huge. Uh, and I've, I advise the funniest part is that I've advised a lot of those companies um, around those ideas because I had had the idea before they even did and just kind of walked them through like, here's my perspective. Here's how I see the use cases and really give them additional insights into their go to market strategy. And also some of the barriers that I ran into as as I was flushing it out. Um, but let's talk about something a little bit more fun. Woo, Venom Foundation. Fun tech. We're back to fun tech. Woo hoo! Yeah. Enough of that kind boring of, I mean, government and regulators. Uh, and, and, you know, but we we <laughs> the, the the government stuff is is interesting, but not as much fun, right? Um, so so we're gonna hop over to something that that is really driving. You know, we were talking about the innovation, right? We're gonna talk. We're gonna jump back over to innovation, and we're gonna talk about Venom blockchain partnering with DowMaker to incubate Web3 startups and really focus on real-world use cases. Now, for those who, who don't know, Venom Foundation is a licensed blockchain in Abu Dhabi um, and has partnered with DowMaker to grow as the solutions provider. Um, and I, I think this is going to be really, really cool because they are focusing on real-world use cases, not just theoretical. But Bruce, yeah. I'll let you let you hop into it, man. Is there anything specific well, in this article uh, you wanted you to jump to? You remember we covered Venom, uh, and this is the the, uh, the Venom blockchain and the Venom wallet and the Venom Foundation, right? Uh, but there's also the Venom Venture Fund, right? And we mm-hmm. talked about that fund a couple of weeks ago. This is a division of it. It's the same guy, uh, Peter Kinesis, is behind it. Here he is on the couch on the right. Uh, that's the, the the Venom dude, and then on mm-hmm. the left is the uh, uh, Dow maker. Um, and it's a super fund. It, it's what, a trillion dollar fund, billion dollar fund? I forget what they were. Um, but uh, the, one of the largest, one of the largest super funds behind like uh, uh, SoftBank, right? Um, mm-hmm. And especially in Web3. And so from what I understand, Dowmaker is someone that has been working with Web3 companies and has a huge network of web three companies and have helped them do things and help projects. And, uh, I guess, you know, uh, help them create communities behind their Mm -hmm. projects and that sort of thing. And so it's really like, you know, Venom's got this money now and they got the, the, the other guy, the deal making guy that was in the other story, right. That he'll handle all the management and the talent and the bookkeeping and the, this and the, that, but you need the, the feed, the impetus, right? The, 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 the real innovators. And that's what doll makers mm-hmm. bring in, right? So Venom's got the money. They got Peter with the money dude, right? And then they got yep. the other guy that was in the other story. I forget yeah, his Christoph. name. Christoph. Christoph Zahun. Uh, uh, no, He's no, 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 the CEO no. Of uh, not the doll maker guy. The other guy oh, that okay. partnered with Venom when it was Venom and, um, I forget oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
right? Yeah. So, so he would he was the one that would help them with their legal and their setup and their this and their that, right? The, you know, forming them up as a corporation and you know getting the best experts in there to help them and and do all that sort of stuff. Whereas this guy's uh, actually bringing the people that are going to need all that help that are going to yep. and, bring and all that innovation, of, right? This is an incubator like. kind of a thing, you know? Uh, yeah, so one of the things. Yeah, Sorry, one of the things ahead. that I, no, that's okay. One of the things that I really like about this is that the DAO maker is so you you talked about the people that bring the legal pieces and now in a previous uh, re- a previous release that we talked about now DAO makers bringing in the framework for all of that to follow and then we're using the Venom network to deliver it and this incubator really brings all those things together so you can bring a real world a real world problem solving idea to the table. And then they'll give you the, and I shouldn't say give you, they'll, they'll enable you to have it from beginning to end. The technology to deliver it, the, the DAO or the regular, like the, the management of, of the regular, of the frameworks. And then you've got the, the, the creation of the corporate structure, all of those together in one place. And that's, that's really going to, to, to do a lot of good. It's going to be a powerful combination. Powerful combination. These guys are these guys are not uh, uh, amateurs to this. Any of them in in any regard, right? Uh, uh, Peter mm. uh, was with uh, uh, where was he at? He was not not Goldman Sachs. He was uh, 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 BlackRock. He was a, the BlackRock dude. He was the CIO mm-hmm. of BlackRock uh, for over a decade. Uh, you know. You got to know investment and you got to know people with money when you're the CIO of BlackRock. Exactly. You know what I mean? So uh, these are all very, you know, knowledgeable, very mm-hmm. professional people that have very deep knowledge about this stuff. And what they don't cover themselves, they'll go out and find experts like Dowmaker and bring them in and say, hey, you know, come on yeah. into the party, right? Uh, you, you're. You know, and, you know, everybody's going to take a, you know, a nice, uh, a nice, ch- nice piece with this and look at how, how much it's going to uh, enable these new projects that may or may not have even like gotten on the board, you know? Yeah. And I mean, if you look at Venom's current portfolio, <clears throat> they have a num- number of D apps and protocols um, that have really been focused on being the bridge of adoption for CBDCs. Uh, or central bank digital currencies in the Middle East, North Africa, and a handful of other areas that are looking to leapfrog the the traditional financial system, and and by by bringing these guys together, I think we're going to be able to speed up that process a lot faster, and really provide some some kick butt solutions that are out there. Um, you know, I, is, am I right in saying that? Uh, the Venom blockchain is the first layer one blockchain uh, licensed by the Abu, Abu Dhabi uh, uh, Global Markets. Yes, it was the first one that was compliant and operated and operates currently under the jurisdiction of the Abu Dhabi Global Market, which is extremely strict. Um, it yes. is more strict than what we have in the U.S. Um, so I, I see that being a, a way to really explain and share that across the globe. And I think we'll learn a lot from the way that they're approaching that. Um, but again, that is that regulatory innovation that we talked about earlier that Abu Dhabi has already done. They they know that they can't stop it. So they might as well embrace it and drive it forward. Like, come on and give yeah, me a big it, hug here. Big, big bear hug. Just, big bear oh, hug. Baby, yeah. oh, bring that blockchain over here, honey. Let's just bring it in here. It's, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, th- I mean, they're, they're really doing those things. Um, this, this is really going to help reduce the risk for investors, reduce the risk for startups. Um, it, it really, because you have the, the setup, the framework, and the delivery technology all together and tied in that follow the regulatory frameworks, the risks that everybody has seen with, with the Celsius, with the Genesis, with the FTX, with now we're talking Binance possibly, right? Um, you're talking like Tether, like all of these risks that were out there for all, a lot of these guys, by doing it this way, you reduce those risks dramatically because you've got these things in place to be able to support them. Yeah. And it makes it a this, lot more fun, right? 
And this is more, uh, it, it's Web3, but it's not just, uh, let's not call it fun tech, right? Uh, it's oh, this it's more focused it, on yeah. solving problems in the real world, right? Uh, it, it's it's not gaming, it's not music, it's not that kind of stuff. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's more use case for real business. And I think like enterprise business yeah. is what they're looking for here. Yeah, I mean, I, I also look at it this way, is that we've a lot... <laughs> The perspective has been is that cryptocurrency is a problem looking for a solution or a solution looking for a problem. Sorry, I said it backwards. Um, And I think the way that these guys are approaching it is saying, hey, we're not going to tell you the problem that we're solving. We're saying, here's what we have. Let's figure out how this this structure can provide a solution to real world problems. And a yeah. lot of people have already figured it out. I mean, we, we've got the federal government using blockchain for for tracking parts and and aircraft and a whole bunch of stuff around that. You've you've got um, identity, and you've got the state of California that's bringing in bringing in blockchain to track their the registrations. I mean, we're starting to see a lot of this stuff happen already, but there really hasn't been a full framework from beginning to end, like what's being brought up here with these guys. Yeah, um, and, and by uh, I doing would call this, this uh, I think what's going to come out of this is what I'm going to call BBAS, and I just came up with this one, <laughs> and it's blockchain banking as a service. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and and I think you you may even you may need to remove that banking out of there. I think you're just going to see it as blockchain as a service. Um. So immediate that, block. You need a blockchain to do something immediate, like you know, it's as exactly. easy as signing up for a PayPal and, and right and and you're. Well, on, I wouldn't you know. say that much, but I mean, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's going it's going to really help because anybody can set up a blockchain themselves. Anybody can fall on a rail. Anybody can do that. Anybody can create that distributed network. But all of the pieces on either ends of that network, like the bookends of building the company, making sure it's regulatory structured properly on top of that blockchain. I think that's the piece that this is really going to really start to support. And it's going to stop things from happening, like what happened to Rihanna and her NFTs <laughs> and OpenSea. You like that Talk transition? About segue, master of segue there. <laughs> when I'm not paying attention, that as Rihanna floats down on her iPhone 15, from the roof of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you know, this is what's really interesting is that one of the the most successful NFT drops in the music industry so far was Rihanna dropping her NFTs sold out in hours, Super Bowl. right? In hours, less right? than an hour, less than an hour. Wow, sixty eight thousand, sixty three thousand dollars in revenue, and they sold out in less than an hour. And and it wasn't a, a super high price, so like her real mm. fans could actually afford to get in and, and be a part of it. Yeah, so I mean, if you think about that, sixty three thousand dollars in revenue. Now, as of right now, the NFTs are trading at about eight hundred and some odd dollars a piece. Right? Uh, I looked at it this morning; they're trading at about eight hundred and sixty some dollars as of this morning. Um, but I think what's really interesting is that because it pays out royalties to the owner of the NFT and to the artist for for future, OpenSea says, ooh, ooh, I'm stepping away from this because this looks like a security. <laughs> um, security. And, <laughs> security, yes. So, I mean, Carbon. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you, you, you've got that. I mean... This, this is going to happen, and this is one of the really, really interesting things about NFTs and the smart contracts that go along with it. You can create the thing that artists have, have struggled to have for, for forever is because they haven't been able to control the royalties, and they haven't been able to get that continually after something has happened. And then on top of that, those people who who have paid the fees up front who have done the things and have invested early really don't get a benefit from from the long term gains either but this is so the also- fan, the fans can actually 
earn from being fans. And yes, just, I mean, just promoting the music, right? Promoting yes. the song and making that song number one. Uh, so let's say uh, the song of the NFT that you bought, let's say this album ends well, up and this- being like the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon album that's been on the Billboard charts since the week it was released and still to this day, right? And think of getting all those royalties of all those radio plays and all that stuff uh, yeah. from here to eternity, you know? I mean, yeah. so you could, you know... Uh, it, it, it's a rare opportunity, you know, well, and, uh, and, and I, I think the biggest piece that, that, that everybody's struggling with and, um, you know, the another block, their head of community and growth claimed that OpenSea is ignoring attempts to resolve this issue and just not allowing the NFTs that promise fractional ownership and future profits. So instead of them trying to figure it out, they're just going, yeah, forget it. We're, we're just going to shut it off. Yeah, we're, we're and, just we're just not going to uh, we're going to turn into a cat and we don't see that. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> you and, can and turn and, our heads towards it and point our head directly at it, but we're not going to look at it. <laughs> well, I mean, re, one of Rihanna's biggest songs um, was Umbrella. And this song, the NFT was re, was for the NFT collection was for Rihanna's song. Um, <laughs> Bitch better have my money. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I can already see this becoming a, a huge hit. Um, and, and a lot of these different things that are going on with it. And, and I'm just, how much is the, uh, uh, that song, how much is the NFT for that particular song trading for, uh, right now? And what is the rise of it? What did it come out at? Uh, and what's the floor now? So, so right now, uh, this morning when I looked at it, it's right around $867 or 0.55 ETH. Um, now, mind you, that is a 330% increase from its mint price. Right. And it's just going to keep going. Now, is that the top performer of all? The, it came out as a That's NFT the entire album collection. with individual songs, the entire right? collection. How, so how many songs is there in the collection? You know? Uh, it. You know, I... Let me look. Let you know, I, look. I keep saying I this, the, the music, the money, and the and the, if she threw some animation in this, I know she had little characters out there dancing with her and all 300. that stuff. 300. 300. So there's 300 songs? No, 300 NFTs. Oh, okay, okay. A How many songs on the, the song. album? This is, this is just for that one song. 300 okay. NFTs oh, for so that song. Oh, so there's 300 different NFTs based on that song that uh, that song inspired. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, and um, not point nine nine percent of total revel uh, royalties have have been to the song's producer and Rihanna. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking here. So if you think about it, if we did three hundred, um, and it was six. I'm just going to do some math here real quick. Yeah, do some math here real quick. Uh, you know, uh, when, when I was watching the uh, Apple Music, uh, and it's sponsored by Apple Music, uh, so they're making a big play, sponsoring the Super Bowl uh, halftime show this year. Uh, that's wonderful, and I was just waiting for a dynamic island to pop out of that uh, – <laughs> To pop out of that glass platform she was sitting on and take her up like one more level or something. The the Apple guys like really missed their cue on that one. I, I didn't think they took much, a good advantage of that at all, but uh, that, that would have been fantastic. At one point, I thought when uh, when they had all the different layers of the platform lined up and uh, she was walking up the layers like a, a, a staircase, so to speak. Uh, the way the light was playing off the individual glass panels or whatever, you know, lucite or whatever they were, uh, mm-hmm. it almost looked like the little cards that pop up on the Apple screen at one point. Oh, I was like, yeah, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I was like, are they like showing, you know, uh, the phone images here? And I was like, no, that's just a, that's just the shadow and the light and the way it fell as, as the camera was, you know, uh, following her essentially. So what did uh, so, you come up with? What's the tabulation? So so there were 200. So the original price was about $210 per NFT. Um, it's currently the floor price is about $867. And, and they have seen about $245,000 in total volume traded uh, for about 155 
ETH so far. So, oh. and this is this is as of what's one hundred fifty five ETH come out to two hundred and forty five thousand dollars. Okay, okay, you yeah. said that previous previously. Okay. Yeah. Um. Nice haul. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and and quick and and. If she somehow integrated some animation into all this, this, this uh, and maybe Apple Music missed the boat with this, right? Uh, but I wonder how Apple Music feels. I mean, like, they're the ones that produce this halftime show. They're the ones that really paid for this platform to allow her to do this, right? Uh, the opportunity well, for her to do this, let's say that way. So, So keep in mind that normally when you perform at the Super Bowl, you get paid millions of dollars, millions of dollars. Okay. Rihanna was paid zero dollars for performing, zero dollars. So she decided to do these NFTs as a way to give back to her community and to generate revenue for her and her team. Wow. So this is something completely different. I, I had no clue that that, that was the, yeah. the, the way she, they did it. I had, turned, I had heard about the, the zero payment, but I wasn't really sure if I had read that right. I was like, that doesn't yes. sound like a music artist to me, right? But, but she's but she, embracing she was, it. That's great, you know? And, and the other piece of that is that she looks at it as this way. is like, this is her way to to protest the the like the whole... Yes. <laughs> Commercialization. The, royal, the royalties that are normally associated with music artists, which usually right. they get pen, they get pennies on the dollar, right? Uh, they get nothing. Well, and she's and she's trying to say and, and I'm I'm this is my perspective. I, I don't know if she's actually saying this or not. But from my perspective, I see her looking at this as, hey, um I don't want to get paid one time for showing up. I want to get paid for the ongoing performance. I want to I I want to generate wealth for me, my fans and my team off of this versus just a one-time payment that nobody benefits from other than yeah. me. Which is a really cool perspective. And, and, and I think you're going to see a lot, was a lot rare more opportunity of really if you really think about it, it was a rare opportunity to do that that normally wouldn't happen in the music world, right? I mean, oh, yeah, with, totally. uh, with Apple doing it, right, with Apple supporting the halftime show, I mean, you know, that wasn't a cheap halftime show to put on with all those uh, with all those cabled uh, platforms and moving and synchronization and all that. That is not cheap, right? That stuff that costs a lot of money to do. Uh, the backup dancers alone was, you know, a uh, quarter million dollars, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, but it was going to cost them that, that much anyway, right? You know? It, so it, it makes me wonder uh, how much Apple had to approve her doing of this and how much Apple encouraged it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's like the Tootsie Roll, Tootsie Pop, you know, knowing how many licks it takes to get to the middle. We will never know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, but uh, definitely with Apple Music sponsoring it, you know, I'm sure uh, there was an Apple, uh, a Rihanna playlist, I'm sure, uh, a spatial audio playlist on Apple Music. I yep. haven't gone and looked. Uh, it's still uh, being pushed highly on YouTube, uh, advertised, right, uh, you mm-hmm. know, on YouTube uh, to, you know, uh, on your home portion, you know. Uh, but because I've been, re- I've, you know, me with the thread guy, right? I've been seeing some little tiny threads of Apple and crypto, right? Apple and crypto around. And I'm just wondering how much how much they encouraged her to do this as a like a trial thing, but without putting their name in, in with it, right? And saying that, you know, Apple's doing this with her or anything like that. Just, yeah. you know, con- conceptually to, you know. Uh, if they, if they to- didn't participate, they're at least watching. So that's one thing I will give Apple is that they may not participate, but they, they watch and they watch really, really closely. But Bruce, man, we yes. just hit all the articles. Are we at the end of the day? We're at the We're end. At of the the end. Why don't you the just, why don't you kind of wrap over. up? Why don't you wrap up like what we've talked about today? Just kind of hit on the things like your takeaways from today's discussion. And then I'll do mine. And then we'll just say, Hey, thanks everybody. So what, what, what is like, what are the key takeaways you took from today? Key takeaways I took from today is regulators are boring and entertainment is fun. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Government and regulation 
like I said, it's the most boring stuff in the world. And this new stuff is so much more exciting to me. Right. Uh, but in between is the guys like from Venom, right. Mm -hmm. That are being somewhat strict with it and somewhat enterprise with it. Right. And mm -hmm. going after the big, big bucks in this, the real world use cases, that means enterprise business to me. Right. Yep. Uh, I think they're the, happy medium between, you know, crazy apes, you know what I mean? Uh, all the way on this side and, you know, government uh, stifling regulation on this side, yeah. you know? And I think that more projects like what Venom is doing is what's going to make this all more successful. It needs to be at that level and it needs to be at that caliber to kind of recenter the industry. So from my perspective, that what I what I took out of today's stories and, and kind of our discussion around it is is one, I loved how you said we need regulatory innovation. Um because without that we will stifle all of the, the great projects that could be here in the US for the fun stuff. Like like the Rihanna thing. Like yeah. the stuff that we saw with uh, the the Catalina whale mixer, right? So whoop, if we if whoop, we're pow, if we pow. Start, <laughs> so if we start Sorry, to stifle that's their that, thing. you got to end, end with every sentence with pow pow. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> so, but but you know you've got those two ends of it, and and for those companies who can figure out how to bridge the gap, like what we're talking about with Venom, that's a big area of opportunity. I think there's area of opportunity in all the areas. But I think that middle area of providing the framework and all the different things within a regular that, that makes the regulatory body happy, that also makes the creative side happy. I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the wins. And I think we're going to see a lot more stuff coming in there. We won't stop hearing about the regulators and we won't stop hearing about the fun stuff. But I think you're start, you're going to start to see a crest or the water rise when it comes to providing these end to end frameworks, not centralization, but frameworks. And I think that's going to be a really, really big thing that we'll start to see more and more of. And I'm super glad you brought that story to the table this week. But Bruce, how can people find out more about what you're doing with the pay interviews, more about the bullet point bulletins, more about you, all the things you're working on? How can they best find out about that? First, I want to point out, folks, this is not a green screen. This is actually something. <laughs> uh, the guy that's in the other frame over here, the guy that's on, on this side of me over here, uh, he's the guy that actually designed well, and it, did I'm this actually, thing. I'm actually <laughs> oh, you're up over, over here. here. Okay. Uh, up, well, up, wherever up you right are. <laughs> oh, that guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That guy. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, up in that there. corner. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, this was the uh, backdrop from the uh, pay show we did in Las Vegas in 2019, and then we had that uh, COVID stuff. So uh, uh, I'm bringing the brand back out. I didn't think the brand got a fair shake, Ted, and, and I don't think you think that it did either. Oh, I don't think so, so either, man. And so uh, I decided to, rather than announce a show right away, you know, uh, let's build some community first and let's build some participants mm -hmm. in that community through bringing some thought leaders in for interviews and Dude, doing so the interviews much like what you and leaders. I are doing here. Right. And, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one type of interviews and, uh, find out, you know, what, what people are doing, what, what their vision, their perspective, their creations. Tell us about all mm -hmm. of it. I want to know about all of it. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to be using this backdrop. We're going to be doing the interviews. If you'd like to uh, have your company product, your leader featured, uh, uh, give me a shout. You can find me at Bruce Q. Burke uh, on every social thing except for right here. I'm at Bruce Burke here. Um, it's really easy to find me. It's really, you know, just uh, yeah. go to any feed and type in my name. Uh, I'm very much out there. And so, uh, you know, uh, we're also still doing the bullet point bulletins, not not uh, changing tracks, right? We're just uh, uh, extending we're expanding. it, expanding, yeah. right? And so also still looking for uh, uh, advertisers, uh, sponsors for that, uh, to for our qualified audience. You know, if you want to reach our qualified audience, just give me a shout. But what are you doing, Ted? Where are you going? We, you're coming down here to Tampa, I think, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well... First, Bruce, I want to say that I'm super excited because you and I have talked about some of the first folks that are going to be on 
the interview, the, the pay interview series. I'm super stoked because they are some of my favorite people. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that piece of it, but you're right, man. Uh, this coming week, I'm going to be in Tampa. I'm going to be visiting a number of companies there and, and talking to financial institutions, technology service providers, both in the traditional finance area, as well as blockchain and crypto. So that's going to be really, really good. Um, so then, then the following week after that, I'm heading to Chicago and I'm going to be visiting with some, again, some traditional finance folks as well as some up and coming folks there. And, you know, really with FinTech Confidential, you'll notice that we still have our one-on-one -on -one interview series, which is our one-on-one -on -one with, with executives and founders in the FinTech area. We're also doing a daily show Monday through Friday, which is the Web3 with FTC. And we're doing that. And, you know, I would really love for people to send me some ideas on the types of topics and or things or even people to interview one on one like Bruce is doing as well. We'd love to do that. And we'd love to share that across the board. But you can get a hold of me at FinTech Confidential uh, across LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Twitter is a little weird. So they made me do FT Confidential. And if you just want to send me an email, send me an email to hello at fintechconfidential.com and we'll go ahead and get you, get, get the information out to you. On top of that, we also have a Telegram channel that gives you our uh, news articles every hour on the hour about Web3. Yes, it does. Every, every hour. I guarantee you'll get one every hour. <laughs> but, but, but what we're doing is we're curating some of the best stories across the web and delivering them to you in bite-sized chunks so that throughout the day you can take a look at it. And, and you know, hey, maybe you – and I don't, I don't do it 24 hours a day. I only do it 12 hours a day. So you're only going to be looking at 12 articles a, a, week, a day. Um, but if you don't want to read those and you want to get even a shorter list, you can listen to the Web3 by FTC broadcast as well. If you want to get emailed about all the fun things we got going on also, you can go to access.fintechconfidential.com, sign up there, and you'll get our, our email newsletter. And you can enjoy all of the great content that we're providing by doing that as well. Bruce, I know I've got a ton of stuff going on, but I'm really excited because I'm also going to be attending the FinTech meetup in March. So if you're also going, pow, pow. go ahead and <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So if you're also going, go ahead and hit me up in the app uh, when when they start to release the meetings. Um, if you want, you can also send me an email to hello at fintechconfidential.com, and we can schedule a meeting as well. There's so many great things going on, Bruce. Uh, I, like I could probably do a full episode of all the really cool stuff that I'm working on. Yeah. But I'm gonna stop here, man. I'm going to stop here. What? I think, I think, uh, I, why I, stop I, here? There's so much uh, more, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Uh, one no, last really. thing. There's one more thing. Yes, sir. <laughs> I was just doing a jobs moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> but now um, everybody, I appreciate you taking the time to, to listen, to like, to follow, um, hit us up on the socials. Um, we're very, very active there and would love to engage with you in those areas. Yes, we're tired of talking to each other, and we'd like to talk to you occasionally. And so reach out to us and, and uh, uh, be a part of uh, the, uh, the Bullet Point Bulletins FinTech Confidential hashtag pay community. Definitely. Well, Bruce, have a great week. I look forward to doing this yet again next week. And I can't wait to see what comes out in the news this week. It's always great stuff. Yeah. <laughs>